Conrad was 10 years old. The doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that the boy would not live another five years. The doctor was milking a vet and counted for little. But his opinion was endorsed by the woman who, in Conrad's world, counted for nearly everything. Miss Anthrop. Miss Anthrop was Conrad's aunt and guardian. And in his eyes, she represented those three-fifths of the world that are necessary and disagreeable and real. The remaining two-fifths were summed up in himself and his imagination. One of these days, Conrad supposed he would succumb under the pressure of wearisome, necessary things, such as illness and restriction and drawn-out dullness. <clears throat> but he knew that without his imagination, which was rampant under the spur of loneliness, he would have succumbed long ago. Miss Anthrop came from a long line of Anthrops, of whom she was the last. Conrad lived with her in a large old manor filled with expensive things to collect dust and inexpensive people to dust them. And though Miss Anthrop did not publicly dislike the boy, it was generally apparent that thwarting him for his own good was a duty which she did not find particularly irksome. Still, all of this probably could have been suffered without too much complaint, but for one small thing. Conrad had developed quite a taste for toast. Knowing this, Miss Anthrop staunchly withheld this simple treat in order to teach an important lesson about perseverance and suffering, and also because she found the crumbs bothersome. And so it was that Conrad was forced to find a place just for himself. The tool shed filled the double row of playroom and sanctuary. He had populated it with a legion of familiar phantoms taken mostly from his own brain. But aside from himself, the sanctuary also boasted two more inmates of flesh and blood. In one corner lived a slightly ragged and altogether frazzled duck, on which the boy lavished an affection that had scarcely another outlet. Further back in the gloom, mounted high up inside a towering locked cupboard, was a large cage, inside of which lived something much more peculiar. Unfortunately for Conrad, his visits to the sanctuary were interrupted by the regimen of his guardian. She placed special importance on the weekly visits to her church, which she thought good for his health. Away from the shed, his life was insufferably dull. His daring escapes, accomplished with the help of his friends, made him feel dashy and not very respectable and, most of all, healthy as can be. Miss Anthrop, of course, felt otherwise. The boy knew that if she were to discover them, Miss Anthrop would never allow him to keep his hidden mates. So he did all he could to guard his secret. One day, Conrad fashioned a name. Orson, the brave, he said. And from then on, he bathed in the green glow of his chosen idol's vital spirit. For Orson was a being who laid special stress on wonder and fun and excitement, on the fierce, impatient side of things, as opposed to the woman's religion, which, as far as Conrad could observe, went to great lengths in the contrary direction. <laughs> the duck, though always present, was never required to participate in the cult of Orson. Conrad had long ago decided that the duck was an Anabaptist, and tolerance is important. It is, it is not, not good, good for you to be pottering down to that shed in all weathers. I know what you have been doing in there, the woman said. I have instructed the gardener to destroy that disease-ridden duck. I trust from now on you can find a more wholesome and healthy use of your time. She waited for an outbreak of rage and sorrow, ready to rebuke it with the flow of excellent precepts and reasoning, 
but Conrad said nothing. Had Miss Anthrop the ability to read his silent, most secret of thoughts, she would have seen something to the effect of this. You smell like rotting wheat. If I were taller, I would kick you in the neck. But lacking this capacity, she perceived nothing out of the ordinary. I thought you liked toast, she said. Sometimes, he said. When he got back to the shed and saw the duck's empty corner, Conrad knew that something needed to be done. And so he asked his fearsome friend. Do, Do one, one thing, thing for me, Orson. What are you still keeping in that shed? I think it is guinea pigs. I will have them taken away. Conrad watched the woman ransack his room to find the key, then march out to the shed to complete her threat. He saw the woman enter, and then he imagined her opening the door of the sacred hutch and peering down with her short-sighted eyes into the darkness where his guardian lie hidden. And once more, he asked, do, do one thing, thing for, for me, Orson. Orson. But he knew as he spoke that he did not believe. He knew that the woman would come out with that purse smile he so loathed on her face. And then she would carry away his wonderful lord, a lord no longer but a simple brown creature in a hutch. And he knew that the woman would triumph always as she triumphed now, and that he would grow ever more sickly under her pestering and domineering and superior wisdom, until one day nothing much would matter anymore. And the doctor would be proved right. But perhaps, perhaps in the sting and misery of imagined defeat, he began to chant the song of his threatened idol. Orson, Orson the brave, the brave ruler, ruler of the shed. shed. Orson, Orson the cunning, whose thoughts, thoughts are bright red. red. Orson, Orson the cruel, cruel. make sure she winds up dead. dead. And perhaps, as silence descended on the world, Conrad watched, and hope crept by inches into his heart. And perhaps a feeling of triumph began to blaze in a mind that had, until now, only known the wistful patience of defeat. And while the maid scampered noisily about, and the gardener nervously consoled her, Conrad proceeded to toast a piece of bread. And during the toasting of it, and the buttering of it with much butter, and the rapid enjoyment of eating it, Conrad listened to the sounds and silences behind him. The loud, foolish screaming of the maid, the scuttering footsteps, the dull murmur and shuffling tread of those approaching with heavy hearts, wondering how to break the terrible news. And then Conrad made another piece of toast, 